Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change our world. Our National Geographic explorers are cutting edge scientists and amazing researchers and powerful storytellers and adventurers and filmmakers and photographers, educators, conservationists, and so much more. Basically, if you name it, there's a really cool National Geographic Explorer somewhere out in the world working on it. Mm. Our Explorer Classroom program brings exploration to life for students all around the world by connecting them through events like this with explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. This fall, we're hosting Explorer Classroom for age 9 to 14 every Thursday at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern Time, plus plenty of other cool events you can learn about on our website. And today, we're very lucky to be connecting with National Geographic Explorer Leonardo Lana, who's joining us all the way from Brazil today. Leonardo is a biologist, a wildlife photographer, and a poet from Rio de Janeiro. He grew up in the countryside, which inspired his passion for wildlife, and insects have become his favorite. He specializes in mantises, and he founded Progetto Mantis, a program that aims, aims to show people how amazing and interesting the world of insects can be. This morning, Leo is going to give us a tour of his garden and teach us all sorts of cool things about the praying mantis. But before we get to that, I want to acknowledge that we have so many wonderful students joining us from classrooms all around the world. We've got students representing Arkansas and California and Canada and Colorado and Connecticut and Delaware and the Dominican Republic and Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, India, Massachusetts, Maryland, Mexico, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Virginia, Wisconsin, and probably more places too. So if I missed where you're watching from, you can let me know in the chat bar. I'd love to give you a shout out. And speaking of shout outs, we've got some special ones this morning. So wherever you may be, if you hear your name or your class or your school, go ahead and give us a cheer. We've got Alec and Autumn's Classroom, the Chastain family, Freya, the HB family, Hartland, Hartwood Charter School, the Hughes Learning Academy, Ayapan Krishnan and their class in India. We've got kid conservationists out there, the Lisa West Academy, Miss Advitha's fifth graders, the Siva family, Mrs. Donacci's enrichment class, Mrs. Nogler's grade eights, Mrs. Pate's third grade, Miss Powers' fourth grade, Ms. Sama's class, Ms. Tran's grade four, Navinith, Parkside Elementary, Praveen and Pranav, the Puro family, Rocky Solis, Ryan and Bo, Up the Grove Elementary, and so many more people. I am so thrilled to have you all out there and ready to learn about praying mantises. And I think that that is plenty from me. It's finally time to turn it over to Leo. Let's take a look around the garden and start learning about praying mantises. Oh, Leo, did you freeze? There Hello, you go. everyone. It's nice. Can you hear me? Now we can. We just Hello, got to. Hello, Celeste. Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, that's, that's perfect. It's really nice to meet everyone and have you from all around the world, you know, this really special place to me. I'm Leo Lana, as Celeste said, I'm a biologist and wildlife photographer from Brazil. And right now I am in my parents' home in the backyard to show you a little bit about this amazing universe. And you know why it's so special? Because right in the corner, we have a huge rainforest. It's not the Amazon, probably you know that the Amazon part of it is in Brazil, but actually we are in another rainforest of Brazil called the Atlantic Rainforest. It's called the Atlantic because we are pretty close to the ocean, plants from the ocean to here. And because of that, in my gardens, we have a lot of animals, a lot of visitors, birds, mammals, insects, spiders, reptiles. Just last week, I saw an armadillo and a snake. So it's a pretty special place that I want to show for you. 
my work is about praying mantises. I researched with a project I funded. It's called Projeto Mantis. And we do this work to understand this universe of the praying mantis. Maybe you don't remember what is a praying mantis and I'm gonna show to you alive, but just for a glimpse of memory, the praying mantis is that insect that has these tweezer-like legs that they use to hunt and prey. And they also have these big, huge eyes that they look directly through you. And you may ask, how do I find praying mantises? So our work basically happens at night. I couldn't broadcast for you during the night, so I'm gonna simulate here what we do. And we go out into the rainforest, into the Amazon, here in the Atlantic rainforest or the gardens to look for them. But the first thing we do is to set a light trap. Here I have our light trap. It's a pretty simple trap, no lethal, so it doesn't kill any insect. How it works? We have this really strong light and a white cloth. So insects from the night, they are flying, guided by the moon. And when they see this light, just like they do at our homes, they just come confused, flying around, flying around, flying around until they perch here. So now we don't have any because the light is not strong enough for the sun. But during the night, this light is like a beacon. It brings all the nocturnal insects because it's a pretty, pretty strong light. And some mantises come as well. Only male adults. Why? Because only male adult mantises have wings. So they're the only ones that fly and they're the only ones that come here. But we got to find also females and young ones because they, we are researchers. So we're looking for the diversity of praying mantises. Another step that we take before leaving to the rainforest is leaving our female box. Right here inside this box, there is a female of a praying mantis. Why do we leave her here? When we have an adult female, there's a strategy they have to bring the males to them because females, they don't fly. Remember I said that only males fly? So the females do not fly and the males have to find them, but they are really camouflaged. So how they do that? The females will release one thing called pheromones. It's like the smell of a female. And this way the male will come flying and looking for her. So we leave the females inside this box that we made. That's a pretty comfortable ecosystem for her. So maybe we can bring some males. I won't show you the female that is inside here because I want to keep her calm. But I have another one, the same species right here in this tree. And let's look where is she right now. Oh, I can see her and she's looking at me. Check it out if you can see her. Do you notice this dead leaf like thing? Actually, it's not a dead leaf. It is a female mantis, a dead leaf female mantis. It's a live insect. They are really camouflaged because mantises do not have any kind of poison. So the way they do to avoid predators is to be really concealed. They are camouflaged sometimes. Some species are like really fresh leaves, green or yellow. Some are like this one, dead leaf mantises. Some are like stick-like and even sometimes they are camouflaged as flowers. Depends on the species, on the region of the world. Mantises are widespread. There are species all around the world, except for Antarctica, it's too cold for them. But otherwise, even in deserts, you can find mantises. And I'm going to show you up close this one. I told you that they are really harmless. And check it out now. I can always handle them. Totally safe. They do live like that, like a hanging dead leaf. So you see. But if I move her in the other position, you're going to see her walking. And now you can see better her tweezer-like legs that she uses for hunting. Oh, she just jumped out from my hand. <laughs> Check it out. So she has the wings as well, but these wings are too cut and she can't fly. She's an adult female. And that's how she's gonna bring the male with the pheromones. It's a beautiful insect. They use these tweezer-like legs to hunt and they use it to eat other smaller insects. That's what they will be eating. I will leave her 
here now, back to her tree. You see, she also has beautiful colors underneath. That's another way to avoid predators because if a predator finds her, then she's gonna show these colors because in nature, when you have really, really uh, colorful patterns like red and black and yellow and black, that means poison. The mantis do not have poison, but she tries to pose as if she had. Check it out, these colors. But how do we find them uh, if, we, if they are not flying to our trap? So after setting the trap, we go out into the jungle. We go out with a flashlight in our hands. So this is the flashlight we use and a camera to take photos of every creature we find. The rainforests at night are the most vivid place on earth. They're full of noises, full of colors and animals. Most of them are going out at that, that time. So we're looking for this camouflaged insect, but we're finding everything and registering everything and posting on our Projeto Mantis pages, social media, and etc. So we go out looking under the leaves, looking for them. And then we go looking over the leaves on the branches because there are mantis species adapted to each kind of environment, each kind of habitat. There are mantis species as well adapted to the tree bark. So you might find some mantis that only live on tree bark. And this is a beautiful palm tree that we have here. It's very traditional from Brazil to have palm trees everywhere, a beautiful one. And there are mantises living there. We can also find mantises on the forest leaf litter or the forest floor. So we have to look basically everywhere to find the mantises. Of course, when we go out to the jungle, we have to be prepared. So besides this equipment, we have to wear these waterproof boots, not only for water, but because we have snakes, spiders, and they're pretty beautiful animals. We just have to respect them and be taken care of because sometimes we can step on them without purpose. And to finish, I'm gonna show you a very special mantis. Maybe, I hope you can see it. It's called the unicorn mantis. And it's a species from Brazil that I have here in my garden. And for the last six months, I've been isolated in this area because of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I found this one when it was just this size and I've been following it grow naturally on its natural habitat. And that's where she is. Very, very camouflaged. I hope you can see her. Can you see? The unicorn mantis, she's quite big right now. She's been living in this area for six months and every day I come here to see her, to see if she's grown, to see what she's doing, where is she moving to. So it's amazing because we're finally accessing how mantises are living in the wild. This was an opportunity I have. And I'm gonna show you up closer because I have actually a unicorn mantis that I'm taking care of. In our project, we don't kill any mantis for research. So every mantis we have to collect from the rainforest, we are taking care until their natural death. It can take a year, two years, depending on the species. So we are taking care of them until they die naturally. So we can follow their life cycles and everything. And here I have a new unicorn mantis that I'm taking care, a smaller one. I'm gonna show to you. Just check before the deadlift mantis so you can see how different it is from the unicorn mantis by up close. Check it out now, how different it is and how amazing, fascinating this mantis is. Praying mantises are always fascinating. They have these huge eyes. They are pretty curious. They move like that because they want to camouflage. So it's like a stick or a dead leaf on the wind, hanging on the wind. And she's a female, a young one. So she doesn't have wings yet, but even when she have one, she will be flightless. She won't be able to fly. 
and look how beautiful it is. We call her the unicorn mantis because of this projection on her head. It's like a horn, so we call her the unicorn mantis, a very special creature. It's not so usual to find them, so it's very special to have one. I've been re rearing this one since she was like this size, a little bit like this, so she's gotten quite big. And how do they grow? They will be changing their skin. We call it molting. And when they molt, they change their skin and they grow, grow a little bit. So she already molted three times and she's still gonna molt two times more until she becomes an adult and gets the wings. Very beautiful. All this shape she has is to look like a stick or a leaf, something like that in the middle of the jungle. So here in my hand is quite noticeable, but when you are out there, it's quite hard to find them. As I said, they are harmless. So we go out looking for them. Sometimes in five hours, six hours, we only find two to three mantis. It's a great night if we find just that, but it's amazing. Hope you have liked it. And now I'm gonna open for questions and answers for all the curiosity you have for praying mantis or the Atlantic rainforest. All of the, our work is also on our social media on Projeto Mantis, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So if you have, if you're on those social media, you can follow our expeditions. Thank you. Leo, that was amazing. I think I could watch those little critters crawl around all day long. They're so beautiful. They're so cool. And we have so many questions coming in online. So everyone out there in the YouTube chat bar, thank you for those brilliant questions. Keep them coming. You only need to send each question one time. Please don't spam us. We keep track of everything that you send us. And students up here on screen with me, get those nice loud voices ready. It's almost your turn. Um, We've got a pretty common question. Eleanor and some others are wondering, Leo, how old do most mantises get? Yeah, that's a good question. So they, depending on the species, because we have 2,500 species at least in the world. So depending on the species, it can live up to two years or a little bit more. For example, the unicorn mantis will live around a year and a half, but the dead leaf mantis will live around two years. And some smaller species, like there are species this size, when they are really grown up, so they won't grow anymore. And these species may live up to a year, more or less, until they complete their cycle, life cycle. So cool. We've got kid conservationists who are wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about different behaviors that different types of mantises have based on where they've adapted to live. Yeah, that's really a great question as well. We're still starting to understand the different behaviors of mantises because in the past, people were looking at them as if they were all the same. Hunters that stayed ambushed or what I mean is like they stayed like camouflaged waiting for a prey to pass by a grasshopper, a moth. But actually we are learning that they are not all the same. So for example, you have the group we call the tiger mantises because they are predators that really look forward to hunt. So they are walking around the forest, looking for prey and actively jumping into them, ambushing them like a tiger. That's why we call them like that. Others like these are ambushed predators. So they are waiting there. Some of them may use even pheromones, I mean, uh, chemical things to attract others. And you have, for example, flower mantises. They look so much like a flower that pollinators like bees think they are a flower. So they come flying to the pollinator and when they, the pollinator comes flying and when it gets close, the praying mantis will hit, strike and capture the prey. So there are many ways they hunt and we're still trying to discover that. That's part of my work. I mainly focus on mantis behavior and I'm starting to learn the behavior from the mantis species in Brazil. So cool, thank you. Well, we've got a student ready to go in Miss Tin's classroom with a question. Go for it. Oh, be sure to turn your microphone on first and then nice and loud for us. Go ahead. Did, um, did you ever get hurt from a, pain, uh, from a praying mantis? Not at all. Praying mantises for humans are really harmless. They are strong creatures. They have these tweezer-like legs with a lot of spines, but actually 
that they are just strong for the micro world they live in. So they are like the jaguars for the insect world, but for us, they are totally harmless. So I never get hurt. And uh, there are species that are huge, like the size of my hand. And if they catch you with the tweezers, maybe they can get, can hurt you a little bit, but that actually won't happen if you don't uh, harm them. So if we just uh, hand them like this with calm and patience and respect, they will be always harmless to humans. You can always, uh, extend your hand like this and make a mantis walk in your hand and it's gonna be really okay. Amazing. I'm very jealous that I don't have a mantis with me over here. We've got another on-screen group with a question. Let's go to Miss Arnoni's classroom. Nice and loud for us. You've got this. What is your favorite kind of pineapple? Sorry, uh, I didn't listen. I can relay that for you, Leo. They're wondering what your favorite kind of mantis is. Uh, you got it here. Yeah. The unicorn mantis for me is the most, most amazing, my favorite. We have two here in Brazil, it's hard to choose. There you have the unicorn mantis and you have the dragon mantis that's quite special as well. But the dragon mantis, unfortunately, it only lives in very pristine areas. So you won't find it in any gardens. You have to look really into rainforests that are preserved. So we don't have it here, it's really rare, but it's an amazing creature as well. But I would say as well, the, the unicorn mantis, because she's gonna get this big. So she's still a young one and she's beautiful. The greens and browns on her and this horn is like a really mythical creature. I love her. Amazing. Well, Leo, another common set of questions we're getting is, have you ever discovered a new type of mantis? And have you ever gotten to name a new type of mantis? Yeah, that's a great question. And we did. That's part of our work in Projeto Mantis is to look for a new species. And I'm actually doing a master's in the Amazon that is to look for new species as well. And this year, we were proud to publish our first new species, the first one we discovered. Uh, it's from the genus Vates, and the name we gave it was Phoenix because it's a good story. Our national museum last year burned, last year, no, two years ago, burned, and we lost five million insects of the collection. It's part of Brazilian history lost, the Brazilian biological history. But fortunately, we have borrowed five, I think, ten mantises from the National Museum to describe this new species. And so this new species, we made it in honor of the National Museum. We call it Phoenix because we believe that the National Museum is going to rise again. Just like the Phoenix, the bird that rises from the ashes, we believe that the National Museum, our National Museum, has this power. What a beautiful story and what a cool name. Thank you, Leo. Well, we've got Miss Ladon's class wondering how long praying mantises have been on the earth. How old is this species? Oh, it's a long time. The group of primates has been here at least for 140 million years. But the, the, these ones, this shape of primates probably arised like 90 to 80 million years ago. We're still discovering that every year there is new research on new fossils of mantis that we discover. But probably is around that. So they were there when the dinosaurs were still here. They were, there were already praying mantis. And you know who are the most relative, closest relative from the praying mantis? The cockroaches and termites. Yeah, <laughs> they are kind of a very uh, derivative, a very different cockroach because they are, they are parents of the, they are relative to the cockroaches, but they have been so long on this earth. So they were able to develop all these kinds of shapes and colors and behaviors. So cool. Well, we've got Dr. Holland's class with a pretty cool question. Go for it, Dr. Holland. Oh, you're still muted. Okay, there I am. Sorry, I've got a few screens going today. So with the unicorn mantis that you raised, do you notice a personality with her? Does she recognize you? Well, 
it's hard to say we <laughs> when you have a mantis for a long time you kind of becomes your pet so <laughs> you bring to vacations you you have to take care it's like a pet <laughs> and i have to say before that that we have all the permits to raise spring mantis and to collect them because we are researchers because uh, you won't just have this as a pet because it's a live animal and it should be in its natural habitat but yeah, I feel like we notice the personality because sometimes we have the same species more than one and we see that one is more like agitated, the other one is calmer and peaceful. And usually they lose their fear about you uh, during the, the time you're taking care of them. So for example, when we find a mantis in the wild, usually they will react to like staying stiff or trying to, uh, scare you by opening their arms and actually after a while when they are with us they won't do this anymore so they won't show any kind of defense pose for us because i believe they won't treat won't perceive us as threatened anymore this is something that should be amazing to research and it's quite special because mantises are really really intelligent creatures they see pretty well they can recognize they can learn so it's an amazing animal and probably they do have their own personalities. Each species, uh, each individual is maybe a little bit uh, faster or a little bit calmer. All of them are different. Awesome. Miss Henderson's class has a lot of questions about mantises, but one of them really strikes me as interesting. They want to know if they have teeth, Leo. No, actually not teeth like us but they have what call mandibles that are like structures that are really strong that they use to chew. They chew the food like this and like this. So they have like four kind of uh, huge teeth, but not just like ours, not like bone-like teeth, but they do have they, their own way to chew the food, chew the insects they hunt. Awesome, and do they ever eat anything besides insects? Yeah, they can. Remember that I told you that you have prey mantis like this size? So every prey mantis will hunt anything that is smaller than them. So if you have a prey mantis this size and you have a frog this size, they can hunt a frog, for example, a small snake, uh, even a small hummingbird. For example, if you look into prey mantis hunting on the internet, you're going to find them hunting sometimes uh, even small birds because you have huge mantis and really small birds. So they will usually hunt on insects because they are easier prey and more abundant. You have more insects than others, but they can hunt anything that they can catch with these tweezer-like arms. Awesome. And we've got Mr. Daddock's class wondering if they have bones or exoskeletons. How are they held together? Yeah, so like every other insect, they have exoskeletons. It means as if their bones were in the outside that's where you see, it's like a shell that keeps her uh, organism. So that's why they also won't grow like us because we have bones inside and we go growing continuously. They need to change this shell like structure, that's the exoskeleton to grow. So what they do is to molt. They uh, every once in a while, more or less, for example, the unicorn mantis every month, she will change her skin and grow a little bit bigger. So cool. Well, let's visit the Campbell kids for a question. Go for it. So um, I was wondering, so you said earlier that they can't live in the Antarctic, right? Yeah. Can they live in the Arctic though? That's a great question and not as well. I forgot to say that only on the poles, on the really cold regions, they can't live. They can live in really cold areas, like in the temperate forests of Canada, for example, on the north or Russia, but or in the South America, south of South America, like Chile. But they won't be able to live really, in really, really, really cold regions that you only practically you just have ice. So you're going to find them just on areas where you have vegetation at least most part of the year. Awesome. We've got Navaneeth who's wondering uh, why female mantises eat male mantises and does that always happen? 
Yeah, and that's a great question that relates to the last one. Actually, this will only happen with species from really cold regions. And you ask me why? Because when you are in a cold region, you have really the seasons. So for example, here in Brazil, in winter, we are sweating because we don't have a really cold winter. But in places where you have a really cold winter, most of the food will die in winter. So the strategy of the mantis that it was the evolution that made it is that the, the female will eat the male. So the female has enough energy to lay her eggs. They lay eggs in an egg case. It's like a little case full of eggs. And this egg case will stay strong during winter, uh, keeping the eggs safe there inside. And they will hatch in spring. So that's a way the male kind of sacrifices himself. So he makes sure that the female he mated with is gonna lay their eggs because actually they, it's their eggs, not only the females. Now in tropical regions like Brazil, and that's where most mantis species are, you have food all year long. So they don't have to do that. The mantises, the males, we look for a lot of males because there's another, uh, in the opposite way, Maybe one female will be predated because there are so many predators here, birds, amphibians, reptiles that eat mantises. So the male looks for a lot of females that maybe one of them will survive to lay his eggs with her. So most of the species won't have this behavior. We think that a lot of them have because actually uh, most of the research on mantises happen with species on the cold areas, on Europe, on the US, in the north. So that's why we, we kind of project this behavior to all mantises. But actually, most mantises, most mantis species won't have this behavior. It's just an exception. So cool. We've got a classroom with us, a life science classroom with Mr. Pierce. I'm gonna turn your microphone on. What's your question? <laughs> How big can they get? Awesome, we got some Star Wars sounds, but I think your question was how big can they get? Give me a thumbs up if that's right. Perfect. Is it, Is it so, so how big it can get? Well, you have all kinds of sizes of mantises and shapes, and you have mantises that they're the greatest size is like this and you have mantises that are bigger than my hand. Here in Brazil, our largest one is like this. So this size, but you have mantises that are a little bit larger than this size. So they can get pretty big. So oh, cool. We've got a question in on the YouTube chat bar. Are mantises cold-blooded? Cold-blooded? Yeah, yeah, just like uh, any other insect, they won't be like us, so they don't have their blood uh it's not heat like us in, independently of the environment so their blood will be their temperature will be just like in the environment that's why probably because we don't have enough research for menses but that's probably why they're more active in summertime that's when it's hotter their metabolism their energy is flowing a little bit faster so uh you're gonna find for example male adults flying more during summer than in winter. Cool. And our next question comes to us from Leia, who's wondering, do they sleep? And if so, how and where? That's something we're just starting to learn about insects in general. I was just reading the other day about uh, bees and how they sleep. They won't sleep like us because they don't have uh, the eyelashes. They won't be closing their eyes. But actually, they have a state of staying uh, still and kind of resting that their metabolism, their energy slows down. So probably that will be something related to sleeping, but the insect way of sleeping. And I see that here by following that unicorn mantis in the garden, I've been understanding the times of the day that she's resting, the times of the day that she's hunting, the time of the days that she's walking around. So it's pretty cool because I finally can start to understand that on the species of praying mantis. Amazing. Well, we've also got Mrs. Jarvis's class with us from New Mexico. Can you guys try and turn your microphone and camera on for me so you can ask your question? Ooh. 
We'll give you a second. But I know your teacher also chatted me your question. So if you can't get that to work, I can ask it for you. Is it working on the Yeah, it's working now. Go for it. We've got a few different devices on. So we're also Mr. Pierce's class. Like we're the same one. Are they related to walking sticks? Sorry, there was a bit of echo. I didn't understand the question. Are they related to walking sticks, Leo? Ah, that's an amazing question. Uh, they are insects like the walking stick insects, but not related. They are mostly related to cockroaches and termites. Actually, people will confuse walking stick insects with brain mantis because they look sometimes the same a little bit. That's actually because the pressures of evolution made them look like really camouflaged. So most shapes of walking sticks and praying mantis will be a stick-like insect or a leaf-like insect. But walking sticks are only herbivores. So they only eat plants and praying mantis only eat, uh, they are carnivores. So they won't, will only eat other insects or meat or something like that. And Another difference is that walking insects, because they only eat plants, they have really small eyes. They don't have to see that pretty well. Mantises have these huge eyes and mantises have these tweezer-like legs to hunt while walking sticks will have only traditional legs. Like all the legs are the same just to walk around. <laughs> That's why they're called the walking sticks. So they are, th those are basic difference to, to see how they different they are. They are all camouflaged and you can see them probably easier at night as well, but they are not so related. Awesome. Well, Leo, we've got students in Chicago who want to say hi to you and they're wondering if big praying mantises ever eat little praying mantises. Oh, that's great. Hi to Chicago from Brazil. And that's a good question. Yeah, they can eat smaller praying mantises because they won't understand the other one as the same species. That's basically a rule in nature for most animals. You have lions, bigger lions that will eat smaller lions if they're not from the family. You have bigger, even birds that eat smaller birds. Like for example, we have in Brazil, a famous bird called the tocano, the token, and it will eat other species of uh, birds that are smaller as well. So mantises at this is, are the same. They won't understand other species as, ah, it's a prey mantis, I don't have to hunt. They are, uh, how do you say, they are hungry and then they find a smaller animal that they can eat so they will hunt. That's pretty natural in nature and it will happen with prey mantis as well. But one thing is that when babies hatch, remember I said the egg case, it has sometimes 20 to 300 babies hatching and when they hatch, they won't eat, eat each other. So they have this mechanism that they will be walking around and through each other, but they won't hunt each other. So they just will disperse, walk away from each other and live their life. Awesome. We've got another question from Ms. Arnone's class. Go for it, nice and loud for us. Please shout for us. Yell it. Have you ever encountered a praying mantis eating another bug? Okay. A praying mantis eating what? Another bug. Eating okay. another bug. Cool. Yeah, yeah, they do eat other bugs. So that's what they they live their life on hunting other bugs, and that's good because actually. In the ecosystem, it's an importance of the praying mantis to have these uh, varieties. Like I said, they are like the jaguars, the lions of the small world of the insects. So they will be hunting these smaller insects and they are part of this complex web of life that you have the praying mantis hunting something that is smaller and being hunted by something that's bigger. So they are part of the system that we have in the rainforest and other ecosystems. Amazing. Well, let's take another question from Miss Tin's class. Um, how does the praying mantis help biodiversity? 
what is the biodiversity of the praying mantis? Was that the question? How does it help the biodiversity of its ecosystem? Ah, so that's the way they help because you have, remember I showed you how we can find mantises on the leaf litter, on the forest floor. We can find in the tree bark, under the leaves, over the leaves, in branches. So everywhere you have these small hunters that are hunting anything that moves and is smaller than them. So if you don't have them, you're going to probably have overpopulation of smaller animals. For example, maybe grasshoppers or crickets that will be growing without any predator. So you need all this set of predators. And prey mantis is one of these pu puzzle pieces, one of these pieces in the rainforest and other ecosystems that is a hunter that's hunting smaller animals, but it's also food for other bigger animals. So many birds and rodents and amphibians, frogs, toads, maybe they will need and they will eat a prey mantis during the, their life and it will be essential to them. So it's a really important part of the ecosystem because it's kind of in the middle uh, between the smaller ones and the bigger ones. Awesome. We've got a little bit of a heated debate going on in the YouTube chat bar. Can you remind us how many total species of prey mantises there are? Yeah, it's around 2,500 right now but there, there are for sure a lot more because there are not that many mantis researchers. Or so for example, just in Brazil, we have 250, but we expect to find at least more 250. We think that Brazil has at least 500. So there's a lot to discover there. It sounds like you might need a lot of research assistance. And I have, yeah. I have some guesses at some classrooms that might have them for you. <laughs> that would be amazing. Well, we've got a fun question from Chris wondering, do mantises make noises? Wow, that's a great question. Usually not, but we know that there are some, I wouldn't say a myth or a legend, but some people already said that they heard a mantis making a small noise with the wings, but not like a, a song or anything, but maybe they make noises. And there's a curiosity, a curious fact that some adult males, that the ones that fly, they have a single ear in their abdomen. So it's like uh, the, uni the only species, the only animal that has a single ear, not a pair like ours. So they, people say, researchers say that this is used for bats to avoid bats because when they're flying and a bat is coming, the bats use the echolocation, it's using noise to find their prey. So they use this single ear, specialize it to hear, listen to bats. And when the bat is gonna get them, they will just avoid the bat. We are not sure if it's really for that because it was a lab test, it was not seen in the wild, but probably something around that because mantises are flying at night and bats as well. So the bat is hunting for insects, the insect hunting bats. Maybe this, do you have these special mentors that listen pretty well? Amazing. And Leo, do you have any advice for all the young explorers out there with us today? Yeah, I would say that you should go out and explore the most as you can and have a passion and admiration for the nature that we still have in our planet. You saw my backyard and I'm full of animals here and in many places and even in the U.S. and close uh, colder countries, you have a beautiful wild, wildlife out there and you have to cherish for them. You have to protect them and you have to love them. Uh, try to know who lives around you, the insects, the bigger ones, the birds, the bats, because they're all special. And we are humans are really lucky to live among these amazing creatures. So look for them take care of them and get to know them because they are amazing. I completely agree. Well, thank you for showing us your amazing creatures today. This has been so much fun. For those of you learning along out there in classrooms around the world, we'd love to see what you do with this. Maybe you draw a picture or write a story or produce a video, or you go out searching for your local insects, whatever it may be. Have your teachers tweet it to us. We're at Nat Geo Education and you can use hashtag Explore Classroom. Leo and I and the whole rest of the team would love to see your work. It's so inspiring. Um, and with that, 
We're gonna wrap up for the day. You can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. If you just can't get enough Mantis in your life, that's fine. Leo's gonna be back with us at 2 p.m. Eastern to show us around his lab and keep talking about praying mantises. I think you're all wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's end with a great big goodbye and thank you to Leo. You guys have been so patient and you've been so quiet. Wherever you may be, get as loud as you can. On the count of three, let's go. Thank you. Bye.